When you look out at the world, what practices or behaviors do you see as particularly problematic? Yes, wars, of course, uh, oppression of people for their color, race, creed or religion. And uh, I l learned that one's got to have compassion and love because there are many wicked ways of mankind, you see. But I don't, didn't want to get into hate and make enemies. So I uh, discovered a path, the middle path. As Gandhi said about the British when they asked him, oh, you must hate the British. He said, no, no, no. But I try and teach them the errors of their ways. You see. So that's the best way of teaching people. Have you had experiences of being out of your body? Um, well, slight experiences, like even last night I found I was having an experience where I was outside myself. I used to have once uh, 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 dreams that I was, my spirit was being lifted up and I could feel myself rising. And my body was just rising and I was scared I'd fall out. So I suppose, uh, but not, though I'm spiritual and have all sorts of feelings and I do believe in the archaic heritage and things, but I'm, I'm not too much in, I'm into spirit, spirit things, but uh, I, I don't know about it out of uh, the world experiences. And why do you think drugs are prohibited at all? Well, because uh, I, I once went to a treatment centre in the 60s run by some nuns, you see, and I remember this nun who allowed me to interview her. She thinks, says, with, the, with use comes abuse, and that's for everything. That's two sides of a coin. You can use something intelligently or you can abuse it, and some drugs are very dangerous. So I'm not per se, that I'd like all drugs to be legalized, because I think to criminalize people for what they put in their body is a more medical problem. But um, I, I cannot understand the war on drugs, which has been a, a terrible failure, uh, being unfair on Mexicans or third world countries and being exploited. So um, I would like to change the drug laws. And I think it's coming slowly in the United Nations. They have to get cannabis out of Schedule 1 as a drug that has no therapeutic uses because and the most important on cannabis medical experiments have been done in Israel by a Bulgarian doctor born in Bulgaria Dr. Rafael Mishulam who discovered the term THC Delta 9 in the 60s and he's doing now first clinical trials on human beings on 25,000 children with seizures in Israel, so I mean, uh, uh, drugs can be healing rather than the chemical drugs, which are pharmaceutical industry antidepressants that get people in the West onto. What do you think would happen with black market if uh, yes, drugs yes, are legalized? The well, the thing is to, to, in a sense, destroy the black market. The that why should all that money go for to illegal to. Uh, drug gangs, I think then there will be decline. There will always be a bit of a black market for anything. But um, when people can, can say for cannabis, can grow their own, can self-medicate even, so that there will be no need for for dealers. And we don't want big pharmaceuticals or the big tobacco companies taking over. But I mean, all my life, though I'm interested in cannabis because it's a healing plant and the other plant is ginseng which the Russians also use in Vladivostok it's a root from Korea but I have never taken uh, any of what we call hard drugs heroin and cocaine or MDMA or anything because I'm um, into natural rather than synthesized things but I did take LSD in the 60s so I'm a bit of a Puritan on, uh, I'm into health and whole food and healing. What would a world in which drugs were legal be like? Well, as I said, there's always this 
with use comes abuse. There'll always be people who want to go for the limits. Though nobody's ever died from cannabis, you see. But people, people with psychosis shouldn't take it. And it's like, like Bernard Shaw said about uh, youth. He said, but I'll paraphrase it, youth is such a beautiful thing. It's a pity to waste it on the young. So, I mean, the people who need to take drugs are the young, and it's ridiculous. Because like tobacco, I had my first cigarette when I was in an orphanage at nine years old, behind a shed or in a hill. And, uh, uh, and we didn't know tobacco was bad. So, I mean, that was a bad drug, but one didn't know. So if I had nine years old to tobacco, I can't stop uh, children. But I believe uh, if they can wait till they're older, it does affect uh, the formations in the brain of people starting too young with cannabis. I started taking my, I never drank much alcohol anyway. I smoked cigarettes and the first time I took any sort of drug was in when I was 27. So I was old enough with, to cope with acid trips and things like that. Do you remember 80s when drugs were legalized in Amsterdam? Yes. Did, did it affect the UK? Uh, well, the, Amsterdam was the it, we called Amsterdam, or I did in my mag uh, magazine, the, the magnificent centre of the new Stone, Stone Age. Because suddenly Amsterdam in 67 with the Provos and the uh, Milk, Milky Way, the Melkweg, the Paradiso and the Cosmos in Prince Hendrik Kader Meditation Centre, where they had a dealer table where you could come in and buy. And um, my first time in Amsterdam during the time of the Provos in 68 with a street theatre group touring Europe called the Human Family. I was five days in Amsterdam living in a squat. We were raided in the morning by uh, the police and we were carted, all 19 of us, to Amsterdam Central Police Station where we were one big cell and we were put in individual cells. And uh, I was eight, nine hours in a cell, but lucky I had a notebook, so I had my diaries. And then the people from Italy were carted back, and all us English were taken to detention cell at Hook van Holland and deported back to London. The observer on that Sunday was Dutch police deport, British theatre group. So uh, I couldn't go back to Amsterdam, but I was never. Officially, we were just kicked out of the country. But when it was the magnetic centre of the New Stone Age, and when I came into the cosmos that time, I'd never seen there were rostra and carpets and tourists from all over the world sitting squat legs, rolling up joints. It was a pioneering period, and Amsterdam was such a great centre for arts. And when I did my magazine, I'd go twice a year to Amsterdam and distributed in that part, he said, because there's so many people came, American expats who were draft resistors came to Amsterdam, so and my friend who worked for me, Bojka, he spent 17 years in Amsterdam, so it was a wonderful place to be, a free thinker's place. Did it somehow influence artists? Like, did it prevent them from walking because they were relaxed and just smoking? Or did, yes, it, did, it, did it have harmful effect? Lots came from it. A lot of good music came out of it. And of course, video heads in the Milky Way was the first video uh, a collective called Video Heads Amsterdam. And there were artists who came together with the first the video was entirely new and they mastered the new technique. So, uh, and lots of pioneering things were done. I mean, Amsterdam was the first to have not only uh, uh, cannabis coffee shops, but um, clubs for gay people. So it, it was more tolerant. But when I was kicked out of Amsterdam in 68, um, I referred to Amsterdam as repressive tolerance. I mean, tolerant, but they were, didn't like foreigners, young foreigners coming to smoke dope in their place, so they would put you on them like they did me on a boat and send me back to England. And I was never charged, I had nothing on me. I'm not committed to criminal offence. 
and uh, it was when I was locked up, 19 of us, the, my Italian friend, who was a young guy, Santos, he screamed and screamed, he'd been locked up in his own the cell, and there was a silence, and he was sobbing, and it was strange, it was a perverse pleasure. Let's see. So basically, uh, legalization of cannabis had only positive effect. It didn't have any drawbacks. Well, it does make people um, uh, a bit... Uh, there were people who would smoke their chillums, who never could clean up a place and sit dreaming. So, I mean, there were waste, what we call whacked out wastrels. <laughs> Almost cut my hair, this... Uh, like the Freak Brother comics, which the, the the creative things that came out of San Francisco was the underground comics. I mean, that broke the sexual barriers. Now today, uh, uh, Robert Crumb drew this um, girl, Honey Bunch Kaminsky, young pubescent girl with big bus, and the title underneath was Jailbait of the Month, because that's what we thought of or they thought of young girls, it was an open and free period. Today it would look like a, a misogyny, you see. Mr. Harris, can we say that psychedelics basically were the trigger of this yes. counterculture revolution? Yeah, more so than cannabis. Uh, the sweep of psychedelic drugs which stopped in... I've been to meet... I went to the 90th birthday of Dr. Albert Hoffman in Heidelberg which was one, and I met um, the person who wrote, the person who turned through Aldous Huxley, Timothy Leary on, was an Englishman called Michael Hollingshead, and uh, he helped me publish my magazine at the time. So, psychedelics, yes, it swept America in the 60s, and even London suddenly. I had my first, on a sugar cube, first LSD, in. February 1966, when it was legal. But I mean, to have the first LSD trip. And I wrote in the Evening Standard, it said that my first play was written as an LSD fantasy. And there was a letter in the Evening Standard when it was out that uh, why, is the why is he getting an Arts Council bursary? Aren't we wasting the taxpayers' LSD? which means pounds, shillings and pence, it used to be known as LSD. <laughs> so how was the trip? Well, it was a life-changing trip. I wrote my play entirely on that night. I was living in the West End because my trip was suddenly to see all the down and outs on the streets, all the prostitutes, all the neon lights of Soho, and there I saw magic. I saw it like a dream cathedral and we were really the misfits of society. Uh, as, and then I wrote a play about it using Otto, Antony Nato, the surreal, who signed the surreal manifesto in Paris. And he was a visionary and a madman. He died in a mental hospital, but he had the most creative theatre ideas. I mean, there were no life stories. There was uh, exploration. There were no life careers. There was life, uh, lifestyles and life rhythms, so it was a new way of looking. LSD was a new way of looking at things. But after a while, taking LSD uh, in the city, not with nature, but you get into people's heads, and I saw how dirty London was, and I never wanted to uh, take LSD again. And if I did, it would only be with in harmony with nature, which I did, like mushrooms. I would take it with plants in the country and nature, but not with people and not in clubs. Do you think if uh, psychedelics were legalized in the UK, it will enhance these creative processes in arts, in film? I think so. It would give new advantage, opens the barriers. But there were also casualties, the people who abused it. I mean, we knew, um, when I say, think of where are you now, psychedelic Simon, who was barefoot in the Hyde Park, or, or the people I saw who uh, uh, were disturbed or didn't find themselves. And 
especially those that got on to sort of uh, heroin and those in the lifetime. In fact, I met a young guy in the West End when I did the Pep Pill story who was 17 and from Pep Pills he became a heroin addict and I wrote about him going to a treatment centre in London, in Soho, in 1970, 71. And recently, a last a year to this month, January the 31st last year, I went to Ireland to his 71st birthday. I haven't seen him for 45 years and he's still taking heroin as patches and he's a grandfather now and he's very small and got a limp. And I went with his son who's a solicitor and his grandson studying law from this junky boy in the West End. So, um, some things that people have uh, some addictions that last a lifetime. What was uh, London look like when you first published your magazine? Well, that was London in the 70s, 77 to 81. By then the acid dream was over. Um, I don't know why. I was going to celebrate 10 years of the summer of love and I was going to hire the roundhouse and I was going to do a program of all the uh, hippie things and the program I decided not to hire the roundouts for one nine but to do a cannabis magazine and suddenly the writers of the previous generation David Solomons who wrote the first book on LSD in 65 and later did 10 years during the Operation Julie trial here who was 54 American author so I had them all rally about me and pass the mantle so I was going to publish your first cannabis magazine which um, and I'd met my uh, wife who I had the support of my wife and the, when, when my magazine came out I had uh, the day an interview at LBC, London Broadcasting Radio, and there was a young guy who worked at the treatment centre where I took this young junkie, and now he was working for LBC. Uh, and he said hello, and I was on Capital Radio every hour, lifting the lid of pot. But this young journalist at LBC is Jon Snow, who's the presenter on Channel 4 today. So I met him when he was helping drug addicts go to treatment centre when he was a young man, so a very good man he was. So London was very, I mean, people were really upset. I mean, they wanted me to be banned and uh, to be prosecuted, MPs were asking. And in the Port of Bella Road, there was a lot of envy. So. Uh, I had someone hit my wife in the face and come to my flat. Oh, it was terrible. Um, and I moved out of London. I moved to the country with my wife and young child. And I... Because uh, I'd broken the rules and I knew then I must do my magazine like a summit stud. That it must be self-published, be sold. I as. In 67, I used to sell the underground newspaper, IT and Oz. I used to sell them on the tubes and in the streets of London. I was a street seller of underground things. So I found the best way to sell magazine is to do it yourself, which limits your market. But um, Why did you feel it was the right thing to do to establish this magazine? Well, I, I don't know why, but I did, and I realised uh, I would put homegrown Europe's first dope magazine because there'd been one come out in America called High Times. So it was the first, and it was much sought after. I meet pe people who still got the issue number one. I got an email from someone who's a game ranger on the Limpopo River on the borders of Zimbabwe and South Africa, who said, what can I do? I've got to copy a home drum number one. I want to sell it now. That's kept it for 40 years, you see. So people have their collections. I've got people who are still fans of the magazine. And uh, I, I, uh, I've used many great writers and poets. And I did a lot of writing myself. So. Uh, 
I wrote to the Home Office to change the laws and uh, I, I, I used, but I was always called an obscene magazine and there were the right to read uh, court cases which were for underground comics, growers guides, they tried to outlaw the growers guide and they guides how to grow a plant and they called it obscene and the right to read uh, uh, a trial was in London and my magazines weren't prosecuted but that they had to have a right to read in this country and they were banning things so it, it survived the ban but I stopped in the coming of Thatcher, Margaret Thatcher and the Conservatives and the right time because the beginning of her, which I later got caught up in one of their new laws that if you sold anything like a cigarette paper or a ten pound note which uh, coke addicts used to sniff it up their nose, you could be sent to prison for selling items, believing it is to be used in unlawful circumstances. So in 1988, my shop was raided by the police and I was charged for selling long king-size cigarette papers, believing it is to be used in unlawful circumstances. And I was at a magistrate's court, it was a summary offence, but the magistrate sent me to prison for three months. And suddenly I had to go off to prison. I had enough time to phone my wife and my two children to say I'm not coming home. Nobody knew where my car was parked and suddenly I was rem not remand prisoner, I was a convicted prisoner and I had to go to Wormwood Scrubs prison and change into prison uniform and walk the yard with people doing 12 years or 18 years. But the next day after two days there, uh, they called me and said, get dressed. And when I went to pick up my clothes, they said, what's the guardian going to do? Well, the guardian champ championed me and wrote a piece, you see, and uh, I was lucky to be granted bail. And uh, uh, a year later, the Knightsbridge Crown Court, I won my appeal. And as the guardian put rolling paper verdict quashed, and even the spitting image, the satirical program, there was a sketch about it where they had the Queen and she's asking these men making cigarette papers. She says, oh, what are those uh, long cigarette papers for? And they say, ma'am, they're for long distance lorry drivers, etc. And the punchline is the Queen says, oh, I thought they were for rolling joints, <laughs> which were funny because the, the smoking of cannabis has been from Oxford, so from the very time in 67, it's been an upper class pursuit. There was always, a, like Zach Goldsmith was expelled from Eton for smoking. Keir Starmer, who's a Labour Brexit man and the former DPP at Oxford, was busted selling cannabis to a, sending cannabis to a friend whose mother opened the envelope. So even the, now the cabinet ministers, in the 60s, Jonathan Aiken, who was an MP, turned on the Speaker of the House of Commons, wanted to try cannabis to see what it like. So I mean, and generations of, in Eton of the public school boys all take cannabis. So I went to a sixth form party of Eton boys invited me and the class lower than Prince Harry. And I was amazed. At four o'clock in the morning, I suddenly see all the kids had eaten the girl from my bread taking hash cookies. You see. So, so it's a bit of hypocrisy. It's like we do it in Parliament, but don't, we don't want you to do it. And now, the most people against change are Labour and Conservative, because Paul Flynn, the one guy who champions legalisation, he calls members of Parliament timid. Tim Farron and Liberal Democrats says a cowardly. Um, Nick Clegg said he was in the cabinet, they're afraid. So it's a very strange issue where they lag behind public opinion, Parliament. We've got a very frightened, self-serving people who run our government at the moment.